on March 3rd, Kurt checked into room 541 in Rome's five-star hotel Excelsior. Courtney and Francis were slated to arrive later that night. During the day, Kurt explored the city with Pat Smear, visiting tourist attractions, but mostly gathering props for what he imagined would be a romantic reunion. He and Courtney had been apart for 26 days, the longest span of their relationship. He'd gone to the Vatican and stolen some candlesticks, big ones, Courtney recalled. He also kicked off a piece of the Colosseum for me. Additionally, he'd purchased a dozen red roses, some lingerie, rosary beads from the Vatican, and a pair of three carat diamond earrings. Love did not arrive back at the hotel until much later than expected. She had been in London during the day doing press for her upcoming album. When Courtney and Francis finally arrived in Rome, the family, their nannies, and Smear had a warm reunion and ordered champagne to celebrate. Kurt didn't drink any. After a while, Callie and a second nanny took Francis to her room and Smear left. Finally alone, Courtney and Kurt made out, but she was exhausted from traveling and the Rohypnol put her to sleep. At six in the morning, she awoke and found him on the floor, pale as a ghost, with blood coming out of one nostril. He was fully dressed, wearing his brown corduroy coat, and there was a wad of $1,000 in cash in his right hand. Upon discovering Kurt's lifeless body, Courtney called the front desk and Kurt was rushed to hospital. It was reported that Kurt had taken 60 Rohypno pills. He was dead, legally dead, Love reported later. Yet after his stomach was pumped, Kurt had a slight pulse, though he was in a coma. Doctors told Courtney it was a matter of chance. He might recover uninjured, he might have brain damage, or he might die. During a break in her vigil, Kurt showed his first signs of life in 20 hours. There were tubes in his mouth, so Courtney handed him a pencil and a notepad, and he jotted, F*** you, followed by, get these f***ing tubes out of my nose. When he finally spoke, he asked for a strawberry milkshake. Back in Seattle on both March 12th and the 18th, police were called to the Cobain residence. On March 12th, Seattle police were dispatched to the Lake Washington house after someone called 911 but hung up. Courtney answered the door, apologized for the call, and explained there had been a fight, but it was now under control. Kurt told the officer, there was a lot of stress in his marriage. He said they should go to therapy. On March 18, there was an incident where Kurt locked himself in the bedroom. Now, Courtney kicked the door but was unable to break it down. Courtney called 911 and two police officers arrived within minutes. Courtney had told the police that Kurt was suicidal. However, Kurt told the police himself that that was not the case. He did not want to hurt himself and he stated that he had locked himself in the room to keep away from Courtney. The police confiscated three of Cobain's guns, and Kurt was taken downtown, but the police didn't formally book him. Kurt had not been the same since the Rome incident, and his friends and family were concerned for him. And it was on March 25th where an intervention was held for Kurt. Basically, you had several people from friends, bandmates, Kurt's management, and they were there to help Kurt and to get him into drug rehabilitation. Kurt and his friend Dylan had just gotten high and both come downstairs and were confronted by this intervention and understandably Kurt was furious. He was given various ultimatums by the people in attendance. Pat Smear, he was the only member of Nirvana that was there. He stated that Nirvana would break up. Also, Kurt's management, Gary Gersh, he said that Geffen would drop Nirvana from their label if he didn't go into rehabilitation. So Kurt was being given all these ultimatums. I mean, ultimately, these people were just trying to help him, but Courtney Love herself would later state that this whole intervention was a mistake and it was her fault and that the whole tough love thing just doesn't work and that she should never have done that. She was ganged up upon. Do you really feel? I don't know. You feel his death is your fault? 
In this instance, yes. Because? Because I didn't need to call for an intervention. You... I shouldn't have called for an intervention. I just panicked. Because you tried to get him off drugs and because he didn't, was not able to get off drugs, even though you were trying to do the right thing, it's your fault. He thought it was a waste of space. Yes, it's, yes. But they were ultimately just trying to help Kurt get him into rehabilitation and get him well because he wasn't going too good at that stage. So a very tough situation indeed. Kurt insisted no one in the room had any right to judge him. He retired to the basement with Smear, saying that all he wanted to do was play guitar for a while. March 30th, this is where Kurt departed Seattle to Los Angeles to go for his drug rehabilitation treatment. However, before leaving to go to Los Angeles, Kurt got his friend Dylan to purchase a shotgun for him. Kurt said it was for protection and because of prowlers. The shotgun and the box of shells cost $308.37, which Kurt handed to Dylan, and having purchased the shotgun, Kurt went home. Later that night, a limousine picked Cobain up from his Lake Washington home and took him to the airport. And on the way to the airport, Kurt realized that he still had the box of shotgun shells on him and he asked for the limo driver to dispose of them, which he said he would. Pat Smear and a representative from Gold Mountain Records met Kurt at LAX on Wednesday evening and drove him to the Exodus Recovery Center. Kurt was assigned room 206 in the 20-bed facility. The next morning, a Thursday, Kurt began his course of treatment. Gibby Haynes from the band Butthole Surfers was in there with Kurt as well for his own drug rehabilitation. Haynes recalled this about Cobain. He looked sick and tired of being sick and tired. Courtney had apparently called Exodus several times that day and she argued with the staff when she was told Kurt was unavailable. During that afternoon, Francis's nanny, Jackie Ferry, and Francis Bean came to visit Kurt. Francis was 19 months old at the time. Kurt played with her, but Ferry noticed that he seemed out of it, and she assumed it was because of drugs the center had given him to help with withdrawal. Jackie and Francis only stayed a short while, but promised to return the next day. Friday, 1st of April, Jackie Ferry, the nanny, and Francis did return to see Kurt, and they noticed a marked improvement in his mood. Compared to the first visit, he was more physical with Francis and threw her in the air to make her giggle. Ferry went down the hall for a moment, thinking she would give the two of them time alone together. When she returned, Kurt was holding Francis over his shoulder, patting her on the back, and sweetly talking in her ear. Ferry gathered Francis and told Kurt they'd see him the next day. He walked them to the door, looked his daughter in the eyes, and said, Goodbye. This would be the final time Kurt would ever see his daughter. In the early afternoon, Kurt and Gibby Haynes were enjoying a smoke in the smoking area behind Exodus, and they were both joking and laughing about a former patient who had escaped by jumping the wall and how stupid of a thing that was considering the front doors for Exodus were unlocked anyway. At around 7.25 p.m. that evening, he walked out the back door of Exodus and climbed the six-foot wall he and Gibby had joked about earlier in the day. He had departed Exodus with only the clothes on his back. Kurt had used his credit card to buy a first-class ticket to Seattle on Delta Flight 788. And on that Friday night, the 1st of April, when he boarded his plane, he ended up sitting next to none other than Duff McKagan from the band Guns N' Roses. The two heavyweight bands, Nirvana and Guns N' Roses, had no doubt had their feuds in the past, but Kurt was happy to see Duff this night, and they talked all the way on the plane ride. It was just before 2 a.m. Saturday on April the 2nd when Kurt arrived back at his Seattle home. 
If Kurt did sleep that morning, it wasn't for long because at around 6 a.m. he appeared in Callie's room, that's the nanny, on the first floor of the house. Callie was there with his girlfriend, Jessica Hopper. So that morning, Kurt walked into Callie's room and sat on the end of the bed. Jessica woke, but not Callie. Hey, skinhead girl, Kurt sang to Jessica, mimicking the lyrics to a punk song. Jessica implored Kurt, call Courtney, you've got to call Courtney, she's freaking out. She grabbed a number off a table, handed it to him, and watched as Kurt dialed the peninsula. The hotel operator announced Courtney wasn't taking any calls. This is her husband, let me through, Kurt demanded. Kurt had forgotten the code name that was needed to reach his wife. He kept repeating, this is her husband, but the hotel operator wouldn't let him through. Frustrated, he hung up. Not long after this, Kurt called the gray top cab. He told the driver that he had recently been burgled and needed bullets. They drove downtown, but seeing it was 7.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning, sporting goods stores were closed. Kurt asked the driver to take him to 145th and Aurora, saying he was hungry. Most likely, Kurt checked into either the Crest or Quest Motel, places he had stayed before. They were near one of his dealers. That day, he also went to Seattle Guns and bought a box of 20-gauge shotgun shells. The evening of Sunday, April the 3rd, Kurt went to his local Mexican restaurant, the Cactus Restaurant. He was there with at least two friends who remain unidentified and they had a meal. The group sat outside and started off with dessert. Kurt was in good spirits, he enjoyed his meal and the group were planning on going to see a movie. They asked the owner for the movie listings and they decided on going to see the movie The Piano. However, as they were getting ready to leave, Kurt's credit card had been declined. This was because Courtney had shut down all of Kurt's credit cards because she didn't want him going anywhere. So Kurt had to write a check, however it is said by the staff there that he was really out of it and it was really hard work for him to write that check. He really struggled to write it. He, his writing was all over the place. But the check cleared and Kurt and his companions went off to see the movie. There are scattered sightings of Kurt on Monday, April the 4th, however, nothing that could really be substantiated except for this one account. This one sighting of Kurt on Capitol Hill in Seattle at Linda's Tavern. I saw him walk in maybe like around 11 or 12 at night, and I just said, oh, hey Kurt, did you come here for my birthday party? And he just kind of looked at me and went, nope. Victoria said that Kurt didn't seem upset or anything, nothing out of the ordinary. He just made his way to the back. She never did see Kurt come back out again. However, she is credited as being the last person to see Kurt Cobain alive. There were no further sightings of him after he left Linda's bar. <laughs> 